go ahead and get started at this time. Okay. Let me just give you some information about the slides. Uh, within a couple of minutes, you'll be able to, uh, to download your slides so you'll be able to view those. Uh, at this time, what I'd like to do is introduce to you our next speaker. She's going to be addressing the topic, current controversies in asthma therapy. Uh, I will introduce to you Catherine Blake. She's PharmD. She is director and principal research scientist, Center for Pharmacogenomics and Translational Research at Nemours. She received her doctor of pharmacy degree from the University of Florida. She's been the principal investigator of over 73 clinical studies in the areas of asthma, allergy, cystic fibrosis, and a co-investigator on an additional 34. She has over 80 peer-reviewed publications and seven book chapters. I'll present to you at this time, Catherine Blake. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia, for that introduction. And thank you all for inviting me to be here today. Um, I will confess, the original speaker was Leslie Hendelis, who was my mentor in my asthma and pharmacy training. And believe it or not, he decided to retire. So his wife planned a secret surprise trip for him during this week. <laughs> so he called me up and asked if I would step in for him. So um, I appreciate being allowed to do that on his behalf. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is I asked Stuart um, a little while ago if I could come before the motivational interviewing talk because coming after the motivational interviewing talk is a hard act to follow. So um, it, it, he was very effervescent. So um, we're going to get a little bit back into some science and things like that. And what um, this talk is to address is some of the current controversies in asthma therapy to kind of give you a sense of what are the conflicts that we have in, in our decisions as we decide what we're going to treat patients with? So these are my disclosures. I'm a consortium PI on two national networks, one the, which is called ASMANET, funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. The other is the Airways Clinical Research Centers, funded by the American Lung Association. And both of these networks have received funding from various pharmaceutical companies for either the trial itself or for the drug products that are being used. And then I also have some funding from NIH and from Novartis in the last couple of years. So this is what I'm not going to talk about, because as you heard Rachel speak earlier um, about what the NHLBI is going to do with the um, updated guidelines. And so these are the six um, topic areas that are going to be assessed with the guidelines. And I will um, let you know in full disclosure, too, that I'm on uh, one of the EPCs that's going to be evaluating the, the drugs, the pharmaceutical products for the updated guidelines. So I won't be going into that because we've got technical expert panels that are going to be looking into, into these topics. So today, what I will be talking about is um, what's the best strategy for step-down therapy. And you heard Sunil Joshi last night talk about various ways of stepping down therapy. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about what the controversy is with that and what are some of the thoughts and why it's controversial. Um, and then we'll talk about the new anti-IL-5 biologics and what's controversial about them. What do we need to know about them if we're going to start using them in patients? Is there a role for proton pump inhibitors in the treatment of asthma? And we'll get into that a little bit. And then lastly, how should we treat acute cough? So it's not necessarily specifically asthma cough. This is acute cough, cough that may be the result of a upper respiratory infection, not, not like a chronic cough that you see in a patient with asthma necessarily. So to start off with, um, this is going to really focus on patients who are on a combination therapy of ICS and LABA. So we don't really know what the safest strategy is for um, reducing inhaled steroids and long-acting beta agonist combination therapy in the patient who is well controlled. And we want to reduce the ICS because it would be good to reduce the risk of, of adverse effects. And we want to encourage 
patients to continue with their controller treatment. And, and we all know patients really want to get off of medications if they possibly can. I mean, I can't, I don't know of any patient who would like to stay on medicines they would always like to reduce. So we know that steroids can cause growth rate suppression in kids. Long-term use can cause osteoporosis, cataracts, glaucoma, um, thrush, dysphonia, things like that. And then the long-acting beta agonists have their own set of side effects. They can cause adverse effects. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the big trials that came out in the early 2000s about the adverse effects of LABA. Who, who is familiar with, that, with those? So some of you are, but these were um, very large trials. Glaxo had planned a really big trial in the 90s, was doing a big trial in the 90s with salmeterol. And the results of that trial found that there were patients who actually got worse, who had risks of intubations, hospitalizations, and even death when they were on the LABA. And they weren't necessarily on an ICS in that study, but um, there was concern, enough concern from other data, too, that LABAs had their own risks associated with use. And so, um, as I said, these could be from, these could include death, hospitalizations, and they were particularly evident in the African American population. So there are concerns about um, reducing adverse effects. So as a result, the FDA in 2011 required the pharmaceutical companies that make combination products to do these very, very large clinical trials. Um, each of the companies that makes Dularis, Symbacort, and Advair to do these big, large trials to look at the safety of Labus. And those trials are just coming to conclusion now. And one of them has been published. And I'll show you a little bit about that, too. So what do the guidelines recommend in terms of step-down therapy? Well, the first thing is, is that everybody should at least show some period of time which they have well control. And the guidelines suggest a minimum of three months. So in terms of um, stepping down, if somebody's just on an ICS, both the EPR3, our guidelines in this country, and the GINA guidelines. How many of you are familiar with what GINA is? So a lot of you. It's the global initiative. Um, for, for the asthma guidelines. So these are used by other European countries. Both of them have guidelines about how to step down uh, therapy. So if a patient is on a medium or high dose, the recommendation is to reduce it by 25 to 50%, about every three months. And the evidence for that, when you see something that says evidence B, evidence means the scientific literature that's used to evaluate, to determine whether that's a good recommendation. And it goes A, B, C, D. A is the best evidence you can have. B is the next best. D is more like there's not really a lot of information out there, so we're going to go with our best judgment based on the literature. So this is evidence B. So it's, it's pretty good evidence. Um, if somebody's on a low-dose ICS, which is step two therapy, then you can reduce the ICS to once daily if they were on it twice daily. So there's very, very good evidence that that's the best step to take. For children, um, and this is not true for adults, but children who have not had any ICS symptoms for, say, 6 to 12 months, so it's a really long period to show that they're stable, then there's a possibility of actually taking them off the ICS entirely. But again, that's evidence level D. So there's not as good of evidence in the guidelines for taking that approach. Now, the issue is for patients who are on ICS and LABA. So what do you do with those patients? Because that's a different population of patients that you're going to deal with. Only the GINA guidelines have information on that, and that's partly because the EPR guidelines haven't been updated since 2007. But it's not part of those six priority areas either. So this is an area that's going to continue to be researched to find the, the right way to do this. Um, so in those patients who are on ICS and LAB, if they're on a medium or high dose, the suggestion is to reduce their ICS dose by 50%, but keep them on the LAB. So you only reduce the ICS dose. Here we go. And if they're on a low-dose ICS um, LABA, which is step three therapy, you can reduce it to once daily therapy. But as you'll notice, there's no recommendation to stop the LABA entirely. So the FDA, though, after those big trials came out in 2010, the FDA came out with, some, with a safety announcement. And what they said was, it said that LABAs should not be used in patients whose asthma can be controlled on a low or medium dose of inhaled steroids. Okay, so that's not the population they should be used in. Then they also said 
They should only be used in a, as additional therapy in patients who are not controlled on a controller med such as an ICS. The third, the third statement that they made was kind of like a recommendation, which is very unusual for the FDA to do. They said, though, once asthma is controlled and been controlled for a period of time and assessed at regular intervals, step-down therapy should begin. And what they specifically said was try and discontinue the LABA. So, um, and, then, and then to continue to monitor them for potential loss of control. So there was clinical practice confusion. You had the guidelines, um, which said one thing, and the FDA, which says another. So the guidelines, the GINA guidelines said, decrease the ICS, but keep the LABA. And the FDA is saying, get them off the LABA. So that's hard. I mean, what's a, what's a clinician going to do in that case? So what is our evidence at this point to help make that decision? Um, First, you have to know what kind of studies are really going to help you answer that question. So when you look at the study design, you want to make sure it's a study design that's, that's long enough, that's well designed enough to answer that question. So the most relevant trials are going to be at least six months in duration. A year is even better. And the reason for that is you want to capture things like oral corticosteroid bursts. So patients may only have one or two bursts per year. So you have to have a long enough time if, if you're going to capture that kind of an important endpoint. You need to have the, the period which they're well controlled to be guideline defined. So it needs to be something that's going to be consistent and everybody across clinical trials is going to use. Big problem with the studies that are published is that everybody has their own definition of what a well controlled period is. And if it's not guideline defined, then you're going to get a lot of variability on who's the right population to step down therapy. So these are the primary outcomes. These are the most, these are what are called core outcomes um, when you're looking at um, uh, relevant patient-related outcomes. So um, oral steroid uses, hospital admissions, ED visits, ICU, death, obviously. And then these are considered emerging or um, um, not considered core, but they're important symptoms, quality of life, and rescue inhaler use. And you can see that these, though, are very easy to measure. I mean, you know if somebody has oral steroids. You know if they've been to the hospital or been intubated. So these are considered core outcomes, but they take a long trial, a long period of time, in order to be able to capture that information. So I was going to show you this. This is probably the best summary of the data out there. Again, these are patients who are on a long-acting beta agonist and an inhaled steroid. And this is from a meta-analysis, and a meta-analysis are very useful because they take data from multiple trials. They have very specific inclusion criteria to include the trials that they're going to study in the analysis. And so they found five good trials. So there were actually two meta-analyses done in the last couple of years using these same five trials. And so when you, can, when you do that, you can pool all the data from those trials. And so questions you may not be able to answer with one trial you may be able to answer when you combine all those trials together. Does that make sense? So you can see that of these trials, they were um, some were pretty large. And then these two over here had pretty small sample sizes. You can see that the period of well control was four to eight weeks. And you heard um, Dr. Joshi mention that in one of his slides last night, which is a little shorter than what the guidelines recommend, which is three months. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, in each of the, um, the baseline treatment, as I said, is an ICS and LABA. And in each of the treatment groups, there's a group that stayed on the ICS LABA at that dose, and then a group that had the, the LABA removed, and they were just on the ICS. So B is budesonide, and F is formoterol. And then you had a group that got, had low dose, um, who were on low dose ICS LABA, and they were dropped down to just the low dose ICS a medium dose group of ICS and a high dose ICS group. But the follow-up period for all of these trials was pretty short, 12 weeks. This one shows it was 12 and 12 weeks, but only the first 12 weeks was used in analysis. So this is really too short of a period to look at any of those core outcomes that are really going to be important to patients. And their primary endpoint, because the trials were short, was peak flow, and this one was total asthma score. So even though that oral steroid use was not their primary outcome, 
they did capture that. I mean, you, obviously, when you have patients and enrolled in a trial, you want to get as much information from them as, as you can because they're volunteering their time. You want to make as most use of their data as you possibly can. And what this shows you right here, this is um, the odds ratio right here. And on this side, when you see the, the rectangle or the triangle here, on this side, it favors continuing the LABA. And on the left side, it favors stopping the LABA, OK? So the odds ratio here was 1.74, which would suggest that um, patients who continue the LABA are 74% more likely not to have a burst of steroids. But as Sunil Joshi was telling you last night, the confidence interval includes one. So it could be that patients on LABA are actually 17% more likely, um, or excuse me, patients who um, are stay on their ICS, excuse me, patients who stay on the LABA are 17% um, um, more likely to have oral corticosteroids. So there's a range there. Um, and so it's not statistically significant. But again, these trials weren't powered, meaning that they didn't have enough patients. It wasn't long enough duration to actually look at that as an outcome. So one of the other outcomes was the asthma control questionnaire. How many of you use the asthma control questionnaire in practice? So you know what that is, what the metrics are, that you get the score. And so again, this is the mean score. On this side, it favors LABA. On this side, it favors stopping the LABA. And this was statistically significant. You can see this triangle does not touch the line. But this mean difference right here was 0.24. And you know what the scale is on the asthma control test. Well controlled is 20 or above. So the minimally important difference for the asthma control test is 0.5. So a patient who has a 0.5 difference over time, for instance, that's a clinically important change. This only found a 0.24 difference. And even at the top end of that confidence interval, it's only 0.35. So even though this was statistical, probably not clinically relevant. It's really just not that important. And then when they looked at withdrawals, you want to know why did people withdraw from the study. And in this case, they were looking primarily at worsening of asthma control. And you can see that this triangle here is well on the side of continuing the long-acting beta agonist. So what that means is that fewer people withdrew from the study when they were maintained on the LABA than when they had the LABA taken off. So that speaks to keeping the LABA on board, OK? <coughs> so um, as a result of this, I don't know, there we go. The American Lung Association, again, that's the network that I've been involved with, designed a really um, robust clinical trial to try and overcome some of the deficits that I mentioned in the study design of those other trials. So patients were on a, these were um, patients on a medium dose of ICS LABA. They had well-controlled asthma by a bunch of metrics, including the ACT score of at least um, 20 or above. And uh, it was patients aged 12 and older. And so what they did is after this run-in period, they had to have been controlled for a month before this, and then they went into an eight-week run-in period. So the total period was about three months of good control. They were randomized either to, to continue what they were on in the baseline, so there was no change here, or they were in the reduce the ICS or keep the la and keep the LABA, which is what the GINA guidelines recommend. Or they were randomized to keep the ICS and remove the LABA, which is what the FDA recommends. Okay, so this was a trial designed specifically to get at that clinical confusion question. And it was a long trial, it was 48 weeks, and the whole point was to be able to measure those um, important events that are considered core outcomes, such as oral steroid use, things like that. So what they found, though, this is the proportion of patients who had a treatment failure. And this is time over weeks. And these are the three treatment regimens here. And what they found was that the proportion of patients in each of those three groups who had a treatment failure was very similar. There was no difference between. So it's what's called a non-inferiority trial. None of the treatments were inferior to any of the others. And then when they, when, when they did um, pairwise comparisons, there was no difference between the two, any of the three regimens when they did two pair wine comparisons. So what the conclusion of this study was is that 
the two step-down regimens had similar outcomes as maintaining them on the ICS and LABA. So um, what I didn't show you was that stopping the LABA was associated with a decrease in lung function. It's a bronchodilator, so that's not that surprising that taking them off a bronchodilator, they're going to have some decrease in lung function. Hospitalizations were few. They were all in the LABA group, but this was not statistically significant. Again, because hospitalizations are pretty infrequent, and it's hard to have enough patients in a study to really measure effects on hospitalizations. And so the conclusion is, with careful monitoring, consider decreasing the ICS dose before taking them off the LABA therapy, mainly because of that reduction in lung function. So I mentioned that the FDA is has required the pharmaceutical companies to do these very, very large trials. And the first trial was published earlier this year, the data from that in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I wanted to point this out to you because there's going to be a lot more data that's going to come out that I think will help us answer this clinical confusion question. So in, in this study, whatever patients were on previously, they got stratified to be on either a low dose, medium dose, or high dose inhaled steroid and lava group. Okay. And the study was 26 weeks long, so it was long enough to look at those clinically important outcomes. And um, what we're going to be able to get, so I'm not going to show you the results of that trial, but what I want to show you is what we might be able to get from those data um, as they start to parse through all that and see what we can get that might help answer this clinical confusion. So they stratified patients initially based on their asthma control score, and in this case, a lower asthma control score means that they're better controlled. The higher asthma control score means that they're not well controlled. But in this well controlled group, that's the group we are most interested in because those are the ones you want to decrease their inhaled steroid um, or LABA on. They had a group that's going to be on low dose ICS LABA who get randomized to um, just the steroid, a medium dose and a high dose. So what this is going to be able to help us do because these studies were about 11,000 patients apiece. Very large. You saw that other slide that showed the biggest trials were like 650. So these are enormous trials. They're going to have a lot of data that might help us identify biomarkers that might help us then know which kind of patients are going to be the best ones to try and maybe even taking them off the LABA. Because if you saw before, there are groups of patients who might be at risk of adverse effects from staying on LABAs. So we're going to want to get them off. But who are they? Who is that right person to try and get them off? And I think that's what these trials secondarily are going to be very useful for. These trials were not designed to answer that question. They were really just to look at the safety of LABAs. But I think that the data that we're going to get from them will be very helpful to further answer this question. So does anybody want to ask any questions about this part at this time? All right. So what about the new anti-IL-5 biologics? There are two of them that have been approved. Oops. You see, it went too fast. <laughs> so there have been two that have been approved. Mepolizumab was approved, I think, in December of last year, and Rizlizumab was approved in March of this year. So two very, very new products that just came out. So I know Dr. Joshi said he didn't want to bore you with one of these slides, but I kind of wanted to show you where these drugs are going to fit into the whole asthma pathophysiology process. So the first thing that happens, this is the airway epithelium here. You get some trigger. So it could have been a viral infection. It could have been a, you know, an allergen or something like that. And then you get a whole cascade of events which occur. And then what happens next is you get production of IL-5 and IL-13. They're very potent pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then what they do is recruit eosinophils to go into the basement membrane. Eosinophils then re release their own cytokines and cytotoxic materials. And that's where you get the airway remodeling and all the bad stuff that happens. So if you can control IL-5 and IL-13, then you may have a really good drug to control symptoms. So to show you how these drugs work, these pink triangles are the IL-5 that's floating around in your bloodstream. This is the eosinophil right here, and this is the receptor for IL-5 right here. So um, mepolizumab is given SQ, and re resolizumab is given by IV, but they're developing a sub-Q formulation. 
And so what these two do, these are monoclonal antibodies. They go into your bloodstream, and then they bind the IL-5 out of the bloodstream. This other drug down here, um, venrelazizumab, <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to get it out right. It, um, it's neutralizing and cytotoxic because it binds to the receptor itself. So it then prevents the IL-5 from getting to the eosinophil, and then it helps to kill the eosinophil. So it kind of works in two ways. This, this product is not on the market yet. So I wanted to give you an idea of how effective these drugs are. Um, so this was just one study that was published two years ago looking at mepolizumab in patients 12 years and older. At baseline, they all had a blood eosinophil count of 300 cells per microliter. The inclusion criteria said they either had to have um, 150 cells at baseline or 300 in the last year, but as it turns out, everybody had about 300 when they entered the study. And that's going to be important for what I tell you later. They were all um, had, severe, had had three to four severe exacerbations in the previous year. These were sick people. Um, their lung function was 60% of predicted, and 25 to 30% of them were on oral steroids. These are sick people, okay? And what they found was that the two doses that they studied, one was IV and one was sub-Q, significantly reduced the risk of exacerbations over the duration of the study by 47%. Very effective medications. Kept these people out of the hospital. So what are the controversies? If these are so good, what's the controversy? So um, I was on the FDA advisory panel that reviewed mepolizumab last um, summer. It was June of last year. And one of the questions that we had as part of the discussion is in the label for both of these drugs, it says it's approved for an eosinophilic phenotype. What is that? What's, what's the clinician out in practice going to make of that? How are they going to be able to identify this patient as an eosinophilic phenotype? So um, it's not defined in the NAEPP or in the GINA guidelines as to what that is. The literature suggests that this might be people who have sputum eosinophils that are greater than, I think it says 2%, and they're not doing well on high-dose inhaled steroids. But that's really all that's out there in the literature. So all we have really to go on in that labeling, the, the labeling that the FDA approved for the companies, is really what their inclusion criteria were for the studies. So the inclusion criteria, as I said, for this study, that they had to have 150 at screening or 300 in the past year, or they could have had some sputum eosinophils. For resolizumab, they had to have 400 cells per microliter at screening. So the question is, is our clinicians going to be able to figure this out to know which are the right patients to select these drugs for? Because they are going to be expensive. And it means going into a study center someplace, or clinical center rather, to get the drug. It's not one you can take at home. And then the other thing is, the other question that's come up is, um, are we going to have standardization of eosinophil counts in the clinical labs, like Quest or your hospital lab, or consolidated? So are we going to have something that's going to be a standard that will help us know that this is really an eosinophilic person? Um, and then is this going to be readily available in clinical practice for, for physicians to use? The other question. The other controversy is, what about its use in adolescence? They included patients who are 12 and older in these studies. And in the mepolizumab study, it was approved for a patient's aged 12 years and older. I will tell you, the advisory panel to the FDA voted not to approve it in patients 12 years and older. It was pretty much unanimous not to approve it for adolescents. And the FDA decided not to take the recommendation of our advisory panel decision. Um, and part of, our, part of the reason why we didn't want it approved in adolescents is only 16 adolescents were ever exposed to the drug during the whole clinical program. That means the drug is now approved, with only 16 patients having been studied in a clinical trial. In addition, when they looked at the exacerbation rate in adolescents, there was no benefit in this age group. But again, it was very small numbers. And as I said before, the small numbers of patients is hard to show a clinical um, benefit of a drug. So it could be that maybe you know, with more adolescents, it would have shown a benefit. Um, so the FDA 
<clears throat> does recommend further study in adolescents. So when I looked at the letter, the, they, the FDA sends out a letter to the drug company when they're going to approve a drug, saying your drug's now approved. And they did say <clears throat> that they recommended further study in adolescents, but they're only requiring studies in 6 to 11-year-olds under the Pediatric Research Equity Act. What that means is that um, the company, GSK, that makes mepolizumab is now required to do, they're requiring them to do two studies in the 6 to 11-year-olds, but no further studies in adolescents because they've met the criteria set forth by the <coughs> FDA to the drug company for studying adolescents. So all we're going to have in this adolescent age group is these 16 patients who were studied in the clinical trials. So that's the dilemma when you're looking at using these drugs in those patients. So when you look at the other drug, res reslizumab, it was not approved for patients 12 years and older. The panel, I was not at that panel, but they also agreed unanimously not to approve it in adolescents in that age group. Again, only, six, oops, only 16 patients um, were exposed to the drug, but there was a slight increase in exacerbation rate in adolescents, and that was the tipping point. Um, for the FDA and for the advisory committee. And then there was some risk of anaphylaxis. So because <laughs> of these um, two findings, the FDA decided not to approve these two drugs, uh, to approve this drug for adolescents. So can I answer any questions about this before we go on to the next topic? All right. So what about proton pump inhibitors? This is your Nexium. Um, Omeprazole, they're, they're available over the counter now. They're available by prescription. So should these be used in asthma management? So there is this puzzling interaction between asthma and reflux. And so reflux can cause asthma. If somebody has stomach acid and they regurgitate it, it can be aspirated into the lungs and then cause bronchospasm. And even this regurgitation can irritate air, um, the nerves along the esophagus here and cause reflex bronchoconstriction that way too. The other thing is, is that asthma can cause reflux by hyperinflating the lungs. <coughs> the sphincter can then dip down into the, into the chest cavity and then you lose that pressure, the, the lower esophageal sphincter pressure, and you get reflux that way. And then there are drugs that may also um, predispose to lower esophageal sphincter pressures and cause reflux. The Theophylline's not used anymore, um, very rarely anyway. So that's not such a big problem. And I don't know really whether, certainly inhaled beta agonists are not the problem, perhaps with oral. But you can see there's a two-fold way that these two diseases can interact. So both of them can cause coughing and chest symptoms. And up to 80% of people with asthma have reflux that's confirmed by a pH probe. So they definitely have reflux. And half of these don't even have any symptoms. So they don't even know that they have reflux that could be causing their asthma. And poorly controlled asthma, um, when physicians think that poorly controlled asthma might be due to reflux, they'll give people a trial of PPIs. So it's expanded the use of PPIs considerably in the last five to 10 years and ex almost exploded its use in pediatric patients. And PPIs, when you go back and look at what the top prescribed drugs are, have been in the top five prescribed drugs for the last 15 years, not just for asthma, but I'm just talking about their use has increased just so much. And I think that their use has increased because they're perceived to be really safe. You really don't experience side effects you know, immediately after taking the drug. So, but they are associated with pretty significant side effects. One of them is community-acquired community pneumonia, which can occur within just a couple of weeks starting a PPI. You can get C. diff from people, definitely get C. diff, results in a hospitalization. Um, fractures and recently renal disease that leads to kidney transplants. So some very significant adverse effects that can result from these drugs. So they shouldn't be used willy-nilly. Um, so are they effective in controlling asthma? And again, I'm going to show you the results of a study done by the American Lung Association specifically to address whether or not this was um, 
these drugs are effective, and they did an, a study in adults and a study in pediatrics. And I'll just show you the PEDS study here. But it was children, these are five to 17 year olds, they're on an ICS, and they're still not controlled. So what do you do next for these kids? Well, in, kind of in practice, a physician may decide, well, let's try a proton pump inhibitor. So many people have reflux, let's just see if that's gonna help. And, and that's what's done. And so in this study, patients were treated with um, lansoprazole or placebo for six months. Okay, so it was a long enough study to see if there was gonna be a benefit. There was 300 children enrolled, so it was a nice large trial. And these, this was the result. So this is um, the change in the asthma control questionnaire score here. And this is the period of follow-up in months here. And in the black circle is lansoprazole, and in the open circle is placebo. And there was no difference. When you look at these error bars, they overlap completely, which means there was not a significant difference between the two. You might think there's something going on here, but what happens as a trial goes on, anybody who does research, you lose people as part of the trial. So when you lose people in the trial, then the error bars start to get broader and you kind of lose some of that important difference that you might be able to measure. So even though that might be what it's look, looking like here, there was no difference throughout the entire trial um, for these kids. And even when we looked at those kids who had consented to have a pH probe, a 24-hour pH probe, which that's really hard to do in kids, um, there was no difference. So even in those patients who had confirmed reflux, so these were asymptomatic, but they had confirmed reflux, the PPI did not help their asthma symptoms. And again, there was an increased, um, surprisingly rather, there was an increased risk of upper respiratory infection, sore throats, and bronchitis in the PPI group compared to the placebo group, which might speak to that whole community acquired pneumonia risk. Okay, so there's no benefit and there was increased risk. So in patients of this type, there's no real benefit to using a PPI. And then the same results were found in a previously published adult study. Almost exactly the same inclusion criteria and the same findings. So any questions about PPIs? And, all right, yes? But if somebody does have symptomatic GERD, they should be treated Absolutely right. Yes, that's a very good point. I should have said that. So if they have symptomatic GERD, then they need treatment with a PPI. But then you're not treating their asthma. You're treating their GERD, and that's exactly what you want to do. You just don't want a physician or a clinician or a prescriber to be treating their asthma with a PPI if there's not a clinical indication for GERD, for the drug. So how should we treat acute cough? Now this came about, again, the FDA had an advisory committee meeting last December, and this came up because of codeine and the use of codeine for cough. Um, so should we, is, is treating cough even controversial? Well, we know coughing is beneficial, especially for wet coughs, because it can bring up mucus. We want to get rid of the mucus that's down there. And a cough due to URI is self-limiting, so why would we want to treat it if it's self-limiting and it's doing something beneficial? Well, it is one of the most common complaints um, for patients requiring medical attention. So I had a URI at the beginning of January and went on for like three weeks. I was sick of the cough, so I went to the physician for, because of the cough. I was feeling fine, it was just the cough was keeping my husband away, keeping me awake. And so it's a reason why people go to the physician or to go get help. Um, and we certainly know it's disruptive, and anybody who's tried to put a child to bed who looks like this knows that the parents are not gonna get any sleep because that child is not gonna get any sleep. And so when a URI, um, the cough may persist up to 25 days in a, with a URI, you've like had it. So you want anything you can give that child to help quiet their cough so that everybody can get some sleep and start to feel better. But the problem is, is that when you start looking at what cough medicines are out there for parents to choose, you start to get into some murky water. And so codeine actually is available by over-the-counter when it's combined with at least one other active ingredient, and it's available by prescription um, as well for the treatment of cough. So in our, in our Florida Gata colors here, codeine, um, is allowed in the states in orange and it's prohibited in the states in blue. 
So you may not have known that you could have walked into a CVS and get a, a minimal volume of codeine. It's going to be have another drug in there, such as an antihistamine or an expectorant, but you can get codeine over the counter. But the problem is, is that um, codeine has been available for a very, very long time. It's been since, I don't know how long it's been, but like 100 years, it's been available um, to be used. And in 1962, the FDA, um, the government passed what's called the Kefauver Harris Act. Prior to that, drugs only had to be shown to be safe. And in, as of 1962, they had to be shown to be safe and effective when, when you're looking at it for both prescription or OTC use. Problem is there were a lot of OTC drugs already out there being used with no evidence of efficacy and probably not a real good sense of what, whether or not they're safe. And it, with codeine, um, there was a recent study that did a, a Cochrane review. And they found that there was no benefit in adults. That was two trials. And no benefit in children in one trial compared with placebo. Not a lot of trials out there. But of the data that's out there, there are only three studies, two in adults and one in children. So even if there were more trials done and it was found to work, I mean, so after my cough, so I went in, they gave me um, a prescription medicine that I'll talk about in a moment, wasn't working. So I went to another place, doctor shopping, and I got a prescription for codeine because I knew it had worked for me in the past. And so there may be other trials that need to be done to see if this is if codeine really does work. So, but is it safe? And that's why the FDA convened this advisory committee meeting um, last fall. So I'm going to go into a little pharmacology. Don't get worried. I'll make it very simple, but it's really relevant. Um, codeine is converted to morphine by an enzyme called CYP2D6 that's in your liver. Codeine for cough, that's the active ingredient. And then when it's metabolized, it goes to morphine right here. OK, so here's the enzyme. The, the gene that makes that enzyme is what we call polymorphic, which means that multiple forms of that gene exist. And so when multiple forms of the gene exist, you're going to get multiple forms of the protein in the liver to metabolize the drug. So what that means is that um, when patients metabolize codeine to morphine, it's the morphine that's going to be the problem, okay? not the codeine so much. So since 2007, the FDA has issued a lot of safety press releases about codeine, about the risks of respiratory depression and death from over-the-counter and prescription use. So the, the first case that kind of came about that um, the FDA was interested in um, putting out the safety announcement for was a woman who was breastfeeding her baby, taking codeine for pain, the codeine was converted to morphine in her blood. She excreted it through the breast milk to her baby, and her baby died. So from that, the FDA started looking back at their database, because it has a voluntary database for reporting adverse events. Went back and looked to see you know, how often is something like this happening with codeine. And they found it was happening a lot more than we would certainly want for a drug that can be given over the counter and get, gotten without a prescription. So the FDA advisory committee, when they met in December, made a recommendation to the FDA to remove codeine from over-the-counter use completely and restrict its use to, by prescription to adults only. So what this means is those 28 states that had it over-the-counter may be required to remove it completely. And all current prescription OTC products will now be labeled for adults only. Now, this process is very slow. So even though the advisory committee made that recommendation, the FDA may not take it. If the FDA does take the recommendation, it still is going to take quite a while to remove codeine from over-the-counter use because there's lots of regulatory processes that has to go through. Is it beneficial to know whether somebody is a metabolizer that converts this to morphine really fast? So that woman that I mentioned who was breastfeeding her baby, when they did her genotype, they found that she had a form of this enzyme that converts codeine to morphine really, really fast. What that means is morphine gets made so fast that the body can't get rid of it. So in her infant baby, clearly that baby didn't have the metabolic processes to get rid of the morphine. 
But many of us who may be fast metabolizers also don't have the capacity to get rid of morphine that quick. It'll build up, you can get respiratory depression, and you can get death. There were other cases, um, two twins, one twin died and one twin lived, who had been given just a single, single or two doses of morphine. So it can happen with very minimal amounts of morphine. So there's no safe amount of morphine. And even if we were to, to get the genotype of everybody before they took codeine, which is kind of unrealistic, there's too much overlap between the people who are considered normal and the people who are considered rapid metabolizers. So that's why the FDA advisory panel said, look, you know what, to reduce the risk, we didn't just need to get rid of it over the counter and restrict its use to prescription use only for adults. So what are the other options? Well, dextromethorphan, that's the DM that you see on, on Robitussin and things like that in CVS, is um, another narcotic. It is the D-isomer of levorphanol, and it has a mechanism of, a, of action for its antitussive effects, just like codeine, very, very similar to codeine. Now, this is also metabolized by that same enzyme to inactive metabolites. So codeine is metabolized to morphine, which is active, which has its own clinical effects. So what happens here is that people who are slow metabolizers get a buildup of dextromethorphan, and they're at risk. So you might think, oh, geez, I shouldn't use codeine. Um, maybe I should use um, dextromethorphan. But you may be at risk no matter, you know, one person will be at risk for one and one person will be at risk for the other. So when they looked at clinical trials in adults, it did show some benefit in four out of five trials. But in four studies in kids, there was no benefit of this drug compared to placebo. Um, so this drug, um, benzonotate, which is known as Teslan Pearls, been around forever. How many of you have heard of Teslon pearls? Just about everybody in the room has heard about it. Um, if you don't know what they look like, they look like this cute little round roly-poly gel caps. Um, and we don't really know how it works. It's related to local anesthetics, so maybe it anesthetizes, anesthetizes some of the nerves in the airways. But when I w went and looked back in the literature, it's really not clear. Those were animal studies, so it's not really clear how, they, how it really works in in adults. When I was given this, this is what I was first prescribed um, at CARES, I think it was CARESmart, um, didn't work at all for me. Um, but it's been available by prescription since 1958 for children 10 years and older. But there's absolutely no published data on efficacy of this drug. I went and looked way, way back. There's nothing out there on the efficacy of this drug. And the number of prescriptions for this has increased in recent years probably because people are looking for an alternative to codeine. In fact, when I was at CareSmart, she said, we can't prescribe codeine, so this is what we prescribe. So um, a lot of places have taken codeine off formularies and things like that, so this is starting to be used a lot more. Oops. But there's serious adverse effects with um, uh, Teslon pearls. You can get tremors, seizures, um, coma, and even death have been reported. There's a recent report to the FDA. And you can see, as I said a moment ago, for young children, and this is where some of the FDA safety reports have come, is with accidental overdoses in young children. You can see these are very attractive. They're small enough. You just pop them in your mouth, and, and then um, the child's at risk. Oops. So antihistamines and mucolytics. So antihistamines, first generation antihistamines, sedating antihistamines have been around for a long, long time. Um, there are some studies that show that they do have some benefit compared to placebo in adults and children. And the beneficial effects may be because they have anticholinergic effects, which are drying effects. So if you have like a runny nose and it's going down the back of your throat, it's helping dry that up, prevent that stuff from running down your throat into your lungs. Okay? Um, but we know that they can cause paradoxical hyperreactivity in children. So if you give them Benadryl, you know, some kids just go wired. They get wired and they're off the wall. Um, the sec and we know that the second generation antihistamines don't work, which is why I think it's probably that drying effect from the first generation. Um, mucolytics, there was one study that's been done with bromhexine, and it showed some benefit in adults. What about honey? So now we're going back to what grandmothers and great-grandmothers would have given you, honey with lemon, right? So honey with lemon, obviously syrups without alcohol are better. 
Um, but it may initiate reflex salivation and secretion of airway mucus that you can then get out. So that may then help be the reason for helping for cough. And the World Health Organization actually endorses the use of honey, obviously not for infants because of the risk of botulism um, in, in honey that may be present. But there have been mixed effects of efficacy in children, and some parents report that their kids get more restless and they're hard to put to sleep after they've had some honey. Depends on how much honey they gave them, but, um, but that's been one of the effects reported. So what about the aromatic oils? We're getting at the end, camphor, menthol, eucalyptus. They produce this nice cooling effect. It's not clear that they really do anything for cough, but I used it in my kids when they were little. We put it in the vaporizer in their room. And there was a recent study in pediatrics that found that vapor rub was more effective than placebo in reducing cough in children. And this was applied to the chest. Um, but you want to be careful when you're applying it, excuse me, applying it to the chest in children because if they touch their chest and lick their fingers or whatever, eat something and then it gets on there, then they're ingesting these potentially toxic um, drugs. And if you decide to use it as a steam vaporizer, which we did in our kids' room, but it's really hot and I burned myself a couple of times getting too close to the, to the vent, uh, what we wound up doing is we'd close their doors, steam up their room really good, and take it out before they went to bed. And then the room was nice and steamy to help them get to sleep. But you want to be aware of the risk of burns um, when, if you're going to use it that way. So we talked about step-down therapy and some of the controversies there, the issues with the anti-IL-5 uh, anti biologics, um, proton pump inhibitors, that there's no use for those if you don't have an indication for reflux. And then how should we treat acute cough? We may be going back to what worked in grandma's day with some honey and lemon and, and maybe hot tea. So I'll be happy to answer any questions for me. Yes? Wait, hold that thought. <laughs> what do you think about treating a cough URI cough in an asthmatic patient who they insist that URI is not one of their triggers? Well, if they're, I mean, you'd want to separate, separate out whether it's the cough due to asthma when they don't have a URI or if it's a cough because they're having all this stuff going on. I mean, if it's a cough due to the URI and they want some relief, then you're going to have to use some sort of an anti tussive like maybe honey or something like that. Um, but I think it, it definitely should be treated, and you need to tell them this is a treatable kind of symptom because you have a URI. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Some of the um, clinicians I work with, we use Bromfed DM in asthmatic patients, and I just didn't know the safety of that. Well, the DM is dextromethorphan. The Brom is bromfeniramine. So you're giving the first-generation antihistamine, which does have some benefit. And then, um, as I showed, there are some adult, some studies that show dextromethorphan works um, in adults. So it may be, there's just not a lot of data in children. So I'm not saying they don't work in children. I'm just saying there's not enough data in, out there that says, yes, this is definitely something to use. But I think Bromfed DM, I mean, I, by the generic, it's a whole lot cheaper. <laughs> I mean, I'm a pharmacist. I always use generics because um, the Bromfed, the Robosus, and DM, they can be twice as expensive. So if you're recommending that for, for families, um, it helps them to buy the generic. Anything else? Yes. Question about Vicks vapor rub. Yes. Um, I usually tell my families that they shouldn't use it. I, I work with mm -hmm. pediatric because of the odor. The, yes. It might be a trigger. For, well, you know. you're right, and that's absolutely true. And when I was presenting this, it was more for the treatment of cough not necessarily to use or not to use in asthmatics, but I think you bring up a very good point. Certainly if they have, um, if the parent expresses that that's a problem, then I definitely would stay away from it. I agree with you entirely. Yes. Is there any evidence for the use of inhalers like Spireva? Well, I'm not really going to go into Spireva because that's one of those six questions that um, um, the expert panel is going to go into when they do their evidence-based review. But I will say, I mean, the mechanism of action is anticholinergic. So if the cough 
has some, in, some cholinergic component to it, then there is a possibility, yes, that Spireva and other anticholinergics, ipratropium would have a beneficial effect. Good pharmacology question. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Appreciate your attention. Thank you. <laughs>